Hi, so welcome to uh, your week uh, one Friday lecture, so the September 7th lecture. Um, before we actually get into the material from uh, our text, I want to just take a moment to um, go over some revisions I made to our website so that you uh, know how to navigate the website and submit your answers for your attendance. Um, so let me pause and open up uh, our website. Okay, so here we go. It uh, will look a little bit different than what we looked at in class on the first day, but I just want to point out some areas that I changed. There's now a section where you can email me. Um, all you need to do is put in your name, your email address, and then type whatever your question might be. But if we take a look, the most important part is if we take a look at um, this area in here, you'll see the lecture obviously will be uploaded here. But if you scroll down, I've now added an area uh, at the bottom of the page where you can enter your attendance answer um, so that you receive uh, the correct marking for your attendance and participation for the week. Um, so this uh, box is at the bottom of all of our pages and notice that this is the attendance for September 7th and if we go to week 2 scroll down to the bottom this is the box that you'll fill, fill out for your September 11th attendance and then scroll on down September 14th and I'll get a notification um, that timestamps when you actually submit your answer just to guarantee that it is in uh, into me by one o'clock on the days that uh, these lectures are due. So again, remember that you have to complete that in order to be marked in attendance for those days. As we discussed in week one, the ability to make images, the ability to read images, and the, the need and the impulse to create images is something that's uniquely human. And our earliest evidence of uh, such a process comes from prehistoric cave paintings. So cave paintings like the caves of uh, Chauvet and the caves of Lascaux are some of the earliest examples of humans' desire to uh, leave a mark on on an object uh, to tell a story through image-based uh, communication. Um, so what you might see in the cave paintings like here at Lascaux maybe is not necessarily what we would define as art with a capital A, but it definitely is where art begins. It's an early evidence of our ability to make and read uh, these images as a form of communication. Uh, many historians have different ideas of what the purpose of these cave paintings might be. Uh, it ranges from finding a spiritual connection with the animals that are represented within the caves or simply just tracking and uh, creating a history of maybe the migration of the animals in the area. Of course this is all up for interpretation, it's all up for speculation, it's all up for uh, academic insight and study. What we're going to look at is uh, the materiality of the um, caves, what was used in order to make these images and how this sets a foundation for the materials that are even used in the modern period and the contemporary period. The caves, uh, the cave images are made from a variety of uh, very primitive art making materials such as iron oxide which is a dry pigment. I'm going to take a look here at iron oxide uh, which is just a dry pigment. It looks a lot like uh, say brownie mix. Um, and it's from uh, rust, essentially. It's a rust pigment, and that can be mixed with either animal fat or saliva to make more of a fluid paint, um, or it can be blown through, say, a reed, a hollow reed, so it becomes sort of a primitive form of spray paint. If you blow it through a tube, then you get images such as this, where the um, prehistoric humans put their hand against the cave wall and then use the pigment uh, sort of blown through a reed in order to create this haloing around the hand. Um, charcoal was also used in creating the images. Charcoal is basically just burnt wood uh, that you can then make a mark with. Artists use this on a daily basis. I use this in uh, my drawing classes. This is one of the uh, first tools that you learn to use as an artist uh, and it you know coincidentally is also one of the most primitive and oldest tools. So wood sticks were easy to come by in prehistoric age and were thus an easy way to uh, create an image 
damage on a surface. Um, it's believed that the only pigments that were available during, during this time period were the ones that give you sort of the orange or the iron oxide, uh, yellow, which comes from a fat and a mineral content, and uh, the black, which is from um, the charcoal. One of the most famous images from the caves of Lascaux is the Chinese bull. And uh, the reason I want to sort of pause and focus on this image is because it shows one of the uh, most basic design elements. And we're going to study the design elements in week two. But what we see here is a combination of line and of value. So line, we have the outline or the contour of uh, the Chinese horse. And value, we have these large areas of uh, color that helps to give the shape form. Uh, so rather than just being an outline of a horse, we actually begin to understand the markings that are specific to uh, this animal. The reason it's called the Chinese horse is because it resembles um, ancient Chinese sculptures uh, and ancient Chinese iconography. So we can see the horse in, uh, in motion, but also because it relates to... Uh, Chinese ink wash paintings, you can see the similarity in um, technique. We have the line or the contour that outlines the uh, specifics of the birds, so the feet, the eye, and the beak. And then we have large areas of value that help to give the markings. It also helps to give a sense of motion and fluidity within uh, the objects. So what I like about uh, sort of looking at these images is it helps to us sort of appreciate how the fluidity of the material like an ink wash will give a sense of motion and line will give a sense of specificity or contour of the shape so that we have definition. So let's go back to the uh, Chinese horse. The detailing of the, uh, the hoofs are um, definitely a, a, an area that's defi defined by the line. So we have line that helps us give that specificity of the shape of very detailed areas. And then we use value in order to give a broad expanse of either color or, uh, or value or marking to give more of a filled concept um, so that the rendering of the horse is a complete rendering, not a simplified rendering. It's also important to make note of the uh, use of dark value to identify the horse's mane to even give more detailing. And it appears, many scholars believe that these areas in here are an attempt at creating shadowing on the neck and the chest of the horse. So very early evidence of an attempt to create um, the appearance of depth within uh, a two-dimensional form. So two-dimensional being flat on a surface giving it more of a three-dimensional look, believing that uh, this horse is a voluminous shape that is actually a rounded neck uh, that would have sort of a light source that would give a shadow on uh, the bottom portion here, appearing like it is receding in space. So when we look at uh, cave painting, it's very easy to assume that they are very simplified drawings, but the longer you study them, you realize that they're actually very complex and their use in materiality and also their use of the very basic design elements that will continue to develop throughout the history of art and develop into a vocabulary that we understand as the foundation. The next object we're going to take a look at is the Venus of Willendorf and it's W-I, I'm going to write this out for you, W-I-L-L-E-N D-O-R-F. The Venus of Willendorf. This is a small sculpture uh, from, believed to be from the last ice age, also during the Paleolithic era. Take that off. Um, small meaning uh, only a few inches high and you can tell by uh, the sculpture that there are specific areas that have been exaggerated. Uh, these are areas that are uniquely female it's believed that this object is a talisman, meaning that it's a symbol or a charm for good luck because of the exaggerated uh, breasts, buttocks, and stomach. Um, these areas are the representation of procreation and fertility, so it's believed that this is a good luck charm for fertility uh, during the Paleolithic era. Uh, the Venus of Willendorf is an example of three-dimensional sculpture rather than uh, being two-dimensional. The caves that we looked at are an example of two-dimensional uh, mark making, and this is a three-dimensional sculpture because it is actually seen in the round. 
from this slide you can see it from multiple sides um, and from this you can really see the exaggeration of the different proportions. Uh, it's also important to take a look at the patterning of the headdress. It's believed that this is a patterning that uh, veils the identity of the woman so that it becomes more of a goddess um, rather than a specific individual. There are many different uh, examples of Venus uh, talisman from this era, all having very similar exaggerated proportions. It's interesting to sort of mark that many of these were found in different areas of the world. So this is not uh, an image or a style that's specific to one locale. We can also see it in what's called low relief. So this is a carving from a slab that's not in uh, completely in the round, meaning that if you turn it over, you would not see the detailing on the back side of the Venus. You only see it from the front side, so it's low relief. But again, you can see the exaggerated proportions, uh, again, representing the, um, the fertility and uh, its use as a good luck charm. So again, we wouldn't necessarily consider these to be uh, art with a capital A, but they are the beginning of uh, the beginning examples of humans' ability to make images and use images as a way to communicate and a way to uh, link themselves with maybe a larger culture. If you're from sort of the the point of view that you believe that these connect them with the gods. This helps to show that art um, will connect with the spirituality. Or if you're from a sort of a frame of mind that you believe that this is a recording or more of a narrative of the events that were occurring, uh, then it shows how art and how image making can connect uh, people with current situations and become more of a recording device of what's going on in contemporary culture, uh, contemporary meaning of that time. Cave paintings in the Venus of Willendorf provide examples of two of the five uh, tasks that define what artists do. The uh, caves record and commemorate an event. Uh, the Venus of Willendorf or any of the Venus figures uh, create an extraordinary version of ordinary objects, being that it, it creates extraordinary examples of female uh, fertility. Um, so we're going to take a look at examples of the other three areas that are considered to be the qualifications of what artists do. And those are create places for human purpose, uh, create tangible forms to the, for the unknown, and create tangible form to feeling and ideas. These are areas that uh, are better uh, illustrated through more modern uh, examples in art history, so we're going to take a look at some of those. So to study the idea that artists create places for human purpose, we're going to begin with Stonehenge. Uh, so we're moving from about 30,000 BCE to about 3100 BCE, um, so a significant jump in the history of humankind. Um, and we're looking at uh, the megaliths of Stonehenge, megalith meaning large stone. Um, so we take a close up here, we're seeing very, very large stones that have been specifically uh, placed for a purpose, um, that being a gathering place. As with most things uh, this far back in history, it's really um, sort of a guessing game to figure out what the original intention was for these locations. Many believe that it was a worshiping place that uh, aligned humans with the gods. Um, some believe that it has uh, celestial sort of connotations, meaning that it will track um, calendar events, um, seasonal events, so it, it's not necessarily, I don't want to really focus on um, the, the possibility of purposes, but just sort of focusing on this as being a location that was um, experienced by many, uh, became a gathering place by many, and continues to be. It's not something that stands in time as only one purpose. It's something that we now respect as an important location, and we kind of ponder the mysteries of it as it becomes um, more relevant for uh, contemporary humans. So it not only stands its place in the history of human beings, but it continues to have an important uh, sort of purpose in our understanding of trying to decipher who we are as human beings.
If we take a look at an aerial image of Stonehenge, um, you can see that originally the location had a series of concentric circles. So we have an outer band here and then a smaller circle. We can see those remnant, remnants that still exist and then an internal circle. Um, and one of the things that we marvel at when we look at Stonehenge is how was this actually created? During this time period, known as the New Stone Age or the Neolithic area, excuse me, the Neolithic era, uh, many uh, advances took place in the form of tool making, uh, domestication of animals and of crops. So we see that the possibilities of making art or making mm -hmm. objects really begins to expand. Um, if we think back, say, to the Venus. Um, talisman, those are objects that are held in the hand. They're very small, so the tools that were used uh, to make these objects were very small sort of shards of bone to kind of carve out these shapes. Um, again, with the cave paintings, we have objects that are um, you know, very manageable, meaning that they're held in the hand to make these marks. When we get to uh, the Neolithic era, we really begin to see uh, an explosion of the scale and the size of objects in which that uh, human beings were able to create. And again, it's still a mystery as to how these large, heavy stones were placed on top of uh, the megaliths. And you know, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to continue to ponder, and I think that probably many of you have seen the endless amount of, um, of TV shows hypothesizing how these objects were placed on top. And it continues to sort of show the power of, um, of art. And I would actually propose that this is probably one of the earliest exam examples of abstraction, meaning that there isn't a recognizable imagery in this. It's an abstracted shape. Um, it has a purpose, it has a meaning, but it doesn't necessarily uh, relate to an object in the three-dimensional world, like an animal or like a woman. It's not an exaggerated form, it's an abstracted shape. So I would like to propose that this is probably one of the earliest examples of abstract um, art making practices, not necessarily art with a capital A, but abstract, abstracted objects made by humans. Yet in the abstraction, you can see the very uh, primitive and very instinct instinctual need for humans to find order and structure within uh, the world in order to reflect our ideas. So it's an abstract concept, meaning that we don't see a representation of an object, but there's still a sense of order and formality. The next next example that we're going to take a look at are uh, is ter tangible form to the unknown. So giving us images of that which before art did not have an image. Historically, this area is seen as one of the most powerful uh, areas for an artist. Um, if you think about uh, being an artist who is credited to giving an image of uh, religious figures that you have worshipped through your culture, it can be a very powerful position to be in, such as Michelangelo's creation of Adam. Statues of Greek gods like Poseidon are considered to be examples of uh, the artist's ability to give an image to the unknown. Uh, and even um, religion such as Hinduism, uh, seeing images of Vishnu for the first time, gives the artist the power of uh, creating things that once were not uh, tangible. So giving tangible form to the unknown. The last area we're going to take a look at uh, is the tangible form to feelings and ideas. I'm going to use uh, Picasso's Blue Period as an example of using uh, paint and color to reflect a feeling or emotion. It's believed during the Blue Period that Picasso was depressed and his depression came through in his palette or his use of color in his paintings. Also the type of imagery that he was creating. You can tell by this image the sunken head of the man sort of represents almost a defeat. The color is uh, very somber, very um, moody if you will, um, and also kind of gives this sort of sense of giving in. 
I'd like to use Starry Night as a comparison um, and utilizing blue in a different way. The brush strokes combined with the warm colors that are seen in the stars uh, help to give this sense of invigoration. So uh, comparing the two of these next to each other, they have a very similar palette, but it shows that imagery helps to also carry the moodiness of or the tone that's given by um, the painting. Starry Night um, almost begins to invade that sense of dreamlike state, it taps into our imagination, it taps into sort of that time in between almost being asleep and almost being awake. It shows um, a sense of uh, exploration that's outside of the natural world, so it helps to bring in this imaginative side that is deeply rooted in uh, very traditional landscape types of imagery. Um, and I would like to propose as your extra credit for uh, the attendance of this lecture, I would like to use Francis Bacon's painting and I want you to think about what does this image uh, tell us about the artist's sense of feelings and ideas? What do you get from this painting? If it's making a feeling tangible, what are those feelings that we're getting uh, in this image? So I'd like you to try to get in the head of Francis Bacon and think about what feelings and ideas he's trying to make tangible through his paintings. This isn't about researching Bacon's work. This is about having a gut reaction to the imagery, a gut reaction to the use of color, the gut reaction to the abstraction of the form, and tell me what you feel is trying to be communicated through his uh, manipulation of a traditional portrait. You'll notice in our book that there is a sixth, uh, sixth task for the artist. Uh, it's refresh our vision and help us see the world in a new way. That's actually something that we're going to use as a qualification for some future examples of art. We're not going to cover that right now. We're going to cover that in some future lectures. So this concludes our week one uh, Friday lecture. Make sure to finish your uh, attendance answer by 1 p.m. on Friday the 7th in order to uh, receive credit for attending the lecture.